Okay, thank you, whoever found that. I appreciate that. Thanks, Vicki, for chiming in on that. So that feedback form, um, the link is up there, the go.osu.edu slash Friday feedback. And um, again, thanks to those who put their um, observations in the iNaturals project, OSU Phenology Fridays, just for our um, recorded viewers. Uh, just a quick reminder of what we're doing this morning. So we're gonna start with our um, Erie to Ohio updates. Uh, Bev Jones is gonna walk us through what she's seeing up in Medina and then Kelly Capuzzi who's down in Logan. Um, you know, our wave goes from south to north, but I like to have our updates from north to south. When uh, Ashley was here last time, she talked about the Buckeye Yard and Garden Line, the newsletter that goes out uh, uh, up updating folks about what ha what's happening across the state, mostly in ornamental horticulture. And Joe Boggs always had the advantage down in Hamilton. He could talk about what was happening there. Um, and it would eventually, about two weeks later, make its way up to me in Stark and Summit counties, the Akron-Canton area. Um, so rather than go south to north and have Kelly tell us all the amazing things she's seeing that we're not seeing up north, um, we'll have Bev go ahead and start with uh, what she's seeing in Medina. Sure, thanks, Denise. Um, the first uh, slide is, oops. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, is the um, flowering dogwood that's right outside my kitchen window. And I took this on 412, which was 209 growing degree days. And the next one is uh, one that I want to follow um, on iNaturalist because of the stage. Can we go back one, Denise? Sorry. Pre yeah, okay. This is um, the middle one is a uh, black chokeberry. Um, so there it was on 418, it was in bud right before the snow came. And I'll follow this so we can follow the fruit that comes towards the end of summer and then the fall foliage. And then there was my prairie crab apple. And so um, this was on the 18th that I took this and on uh, Wednesday, when I looked out, it was, this tree's about eight foot tall. It was totally bent over with snow. And so, um, like Bob said, I brushed the snow off and uh, now it's looking good. Okay, next, Denise. So <clears throat> this was something that we observed this year that I'd never seen. This is um, tips on the ground of my Norway spruce. And I was befuddled about what was going on and ended up finding out there was lots of calls on the hotline. And after discussion with uh, extension um, people, that educators, that it was decided that the cause was a red squirrel. So he snips off the stem, he eats the bud and drops it to the ground. So lots of buds on the Norway spruce. So I expect to see a lot of pine cones next year. And the bottom picture is just my hellebore, which is one of the first things that blooms. And this was blooming the first week in March um, in my garden. And then next, <clears throat> it was a nice rainy day and I didn't think I'd get any observations. And I stepped outside my side garage door and found this American toad. So he's right next to that kitchen garden. He can find some places to hide and it's nice and moist there for him. And then he can make his way back to the pond later. <clears throat> and then we had the painted turtle. He uh, was, well, I'm not sure if it was a he or she, but it was walking um, out in our front yard and on its way back to the pond. So it was a, I know this was a great way to use because then I could identify what kind of turtle it was. And then these last two slides are from the phenology garden. Um, there's the uh, Redozier, um, uh, sorry, uh, the Redozier dogwood and the golden gold tide for Scythia. And these were the first um, ornamental shrubs that were put in the garden along with 30 other um, different um, plants, 11 of those are pollinators. Uh, this garden was started in 214 and it's behind our ARI Root Candle Company headquarters. Um, we have it all fenced in and then we got additional space now behind it. So we're now doing some dividing and transplanting and we're gonna add some more pollinator plants uh, this year. 
And that's what's going on in Medina, uh, other than we're stuck on 230 degree days since last, since Tuesday. Hey, thanks so much, Bev. Uh, sorry, I was having a few uh, <laughs> control issues with getting the slides to advance, so my apologies. No yeah, so Bev, very active in that phenology garden in uh, Medina County that Ashley mentioned last week and also a volunteer pollinator specialist and master gardener. So thanks, Bev, for letting us know what's up uh, your way. And then Kelly, who works with the Ohio EPA and is also a volunteer pollinator specialist, uh, gonna give us a, an update from some places that she's been down in Southern Ohio. Um, is it possible to share my screen, Janine? It is, absolutely. Let me stop okay. sharing. Yep, you're, um, you should be good to share. Uh, let's see, did I make you a co-host? I think I got it. Okay. So let me know, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so here's some news from the South. Um, uh, I live down in the Hawking Hills region of um, Southern Ohio. Um, I'm about an hour south of Columbus. <clears throat> so um, we've had a really great spring. I think we were, if you were hearing us chat earlier, you'll, you'll hear that we were um, really seeing a lot of, I'm not seeing why this isn't going forward. Let's see. <laughs> Can't move it. Um, but we were having a lot of um, good discussions on um, what we were seeing uh, spring ephemeral wise, and I've, I've gotten to see a lot of really cool spring ephemerals. So um, let me see, oh, here we go. So um, about uh, two weeks ago, I, I did a trip down to Adams County with Susan Moore, who's in our, our group. And um, we met, Susan and I met at the Ohio River Bluffs. This is an Ark of Appalachia preserve. Um, it's, it's a private nature preserve, but they're open to the public. So anybody can go down and see these. So they're, they're just, I would highly recommend if you can ever go down to see some of these nature preserves, they're just beautiful. And they're so loaded with wildflowers. Um, they're just amazing. Um, they probably have 10 or 15 preserves down in Southern Ohio. So um, definitely recommend going down there. Um, we were seeing all kinds of really beautiful things. We were seeing dwarf larkspur, blue-eyed marys. Um, there were scenes sometimes where you had like toad trillium and blue-eyed marys and um, uh, bluebells. And it's like everything was just like in the same picture. It was so amazing. Um, and the growing degree days down there in April, April 11th was... For 246. So, I mean, they're so far ahead of even where, you know, where I am in Hawking Hills. Um, they're usually at least 10 growing degree days. That's what I've been noticing, 10 to 15 growing degree days ahead of where, where I am. Um, we also saw uh, just the colors is just amazing. Wood poppies and larkspur and uh, blue-eyed marys again. And um, and some, some uh, one of the, we saw a photographer there who was taking pictures of these bluebells because they were pink. So I guess that's an unusual thing too. Um, but it was just, it was just a great um, visit. And then Susan captured these really awesome pictures of this um, black and gold uh, bumblebee. She actually got this confirmed on iNaturalist with John Asher. So um, this is on dwarf larkspur and we watched her um, probably for about 20 minutes and she was hitting dwarf, dwarf larkspur. That's all she was going to. It was really, really neat to see that. Um, so next I went, I was in Hawking Hills where I live and, um, I feel very fortunate because I get to see this kind of beautiful area all the time. Um, it's easy to take for granted sometimes, uh, that I just live in such a a really pretty place, but I try to get out and hike as much as possible because I just love um, the woods here. Um, there, the trillium were just really great this year. I was seeing so many different types of trillium, but the red trilliums were, were really out this week uh, or last week, and it, it's just been gorgeous. I even found a blood root down in the corner there that was still blooming, which they actually um, bloom pretty quickly and then they lose their, their blossom, but then you see the leaves. So but I was still seeing that. Um, and then up in the, 
the top right, um, I had a, a morel mushroom pop up in my yard this week or last week. Um, and I can thank Doug Tallamy for that because uh, he inspired me to really start clearing out a lot of the invasives in my yard. And after I did that, I ended up finding a, an, a patch of elm trees that I didn't even know I had. And um, lo and behold, there's uh, morels popping up around them. So thank you, Doug Tallamy. <laughs> Um, and then the last trip I did recently this week um, on April 20th, I went down to Adams County again. I was working, I was doing some work with Laura Hughes down on the edge of Appalachia Preserve. And um, look at the growing degree days. It was 283 <laughs> this week. So um, they're just so far ahead. I mean, you said, Bev, you said that you were at 209. I'm, I mean, it's just, it's just uh, incredible down there. So I was seeing showy orchis, um, the columbine were, were just blooming beautifully, um, the yellow buckeyes were out. <clears throat> um, the columbine is growing on uh, cliffs, like it's limestone, it's called the Peebles limestone, and they're just growing out of the, the side of a cliff. I mean, there's no soil in there at all. It's just there and they're just all over the place. It's really neat. It's such neat habitat down there. Um, and then one of my favorite things that I got to see, my, this is a life plant for me, I actually got to see a cross vine. I've never seen one of these before. Uh, it's Begonia caprolata. Um, and I hope I said that right, I can't say Latin. <laughs> um, but uh, I did get to see that on Tuesday as well. Um, they also like to grow on those um, limestone cliffs, the, the Peebles limestone. And they're really rare in the state. You're only gonna see these in, um, along the Ohio River. I'll show you a map. Um, this is from iNaturalist. So I, I uploaded a, the pictures to iNaturalist and there's only been 10 observations um, on there. So you can see they're really only along the Ohio River. Um, they tend to bloom, it looks like mostly in, in March and April, but it looks like they can bloom in other times as well. Um, but it, most of the observations has been in, in April. Um, and what else was I going to tell you about that? Uh, I think that's it. Um, that's really all I had for my report. Um, I think I'm a little early, so I had a, a really quick thing to tell you about. Um, I don't think Susan's on right now, but um, I did want to put out a cautionary tale about going to Adams County because um, I got a text from Susan right after the next day, and she said she had a tick on her back, and she actually had to get a friend to help her to remove it um, because it was in the middle of her back. And it ended up being a Lone Star tick. Um, so uh, there, the, I, and I actually had a Lone Star tick on me too on um, Tuesday when I was down there. So the ticks are so thick in Adams County. So that's the one thing I would caution you about is uh, just remember when you go down there, uh, even though they have pretty flowers, they also have a lot of ticks. <laughs> So well, thanks, Kelly. The cross vine is really amazing. I've never seen it. Uh, and, and thanks for the tick warning. Um, yeah. You know, I think we don't always think about what's out there and, and making sure, you know, I haven't treated all my field clothes yet with the um, pyrethrin to make sure I'm tick resistant. So it's a good, uh, it's a good reminder. Um, next, we're going to have Dr. Bob give us our history short for today. Bob, I'll... <clears throat> Let's see here if we can share the screen, go to this, then we'll uh, share that and do that. Can everyone, can you see that now? Looks great. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to uh, today talk about the uh, North American Beef Phenology Program. Uh, both the lessons that have come out of that and what I call the meta lessons, the, the big picture lessons that come out of that uh, with regard to a phenology program. The, um, uh, this all started off with very humble beginnings. Uh, Wells Cook was a, uh, he was really a teacher at an American Indian school in Minnesota, and he was just interested in. Uh, bird migration. And so he was interested in seeing how uh, the migration uh, 
uh, patterns happen throughout the Mississippi Flyway. And in order to do that, because uh, he couldn't run around and do all of that, he started uh, inviting uh, volunteers to help keep records of uh, first appearance, uh, maximum appearance, and uh, departure of uh, various species in the uh, various bird species in the Mississippi Flyway, uh, hoping that this coordinated effort would enlarge our knowledge of the interesting subject of migration. Well, that, that went on and then it was picked up by the uh, American Ornithological Ornithologists Union, uh, which turned into the Committee on Migration of Birds. And uh, many, many people got interested in that, very much like uh, we're interested in the phenology of plants and various animals here in Ohio. Uh, they just volunteered their time. And it grew and it grew. It was apparently the thing to do. And uh, at its maximum, at the, around the turn of the century, there were over 3,000 volunteers submitting records on uh, what has been counted to be about 870 bird species. By that time, it was uh, coordinated by the Biological Survey of the USDA. And uh, here are some of the records. Uh, you can see some of them were more uh, loquacious. Uh, here's uh, comments on the passenger pigeon. Look at particular this one in the middle. Look who did that. That's Aldo Leopold himself uh, writing this in uh, 1917. And then by the 1930s, they had tried to standardize the record keeping um, by putting it on these cards. So you can imagine you have 3,000, as many as 3,000 people making many observations. Well, it turns out that there were about six, 6 million of these uh, observations all, all stored. Um, it became, of course, a large program, uh, later became the Bureau of Biological Survey uh, which uh, later became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, within the Department of uh, the Interior, United States Department of the Interior. But as often happens, or as can happen, um, people lost interest in this. Uh, they had other things to do. Um, Volunteers were lost. And so by 1970, it had dwindled down to so few people uh, submitting records that it was no longer uh, a viable program. Uh, however, at least the United States Geological Survey retained the records. So the records were not lost, uh, but there they were. Uh, now, Someone, eventually, fortunately, someone said, you know, we have 90 years of records of bird migrations. Let's do something with that. And so they, someone was uh, Sam Drogi, who, uh, you know, who I'm familiar with from uh, his uh, bee studies. But uh, here he is uh, working on spring arrivals in Maryland, in Washington, DC. And so he put together a uh, paper uh, submitted to the American, to the uh, Maryland BirdLife uh, Journal. And uh, in this, he used the uh, biological, or excuse me, the uh, bird phenology uh, program data for six species for which he could uh, have fairly reliable uh, data. He felt that he could trust these data uh, and that the main thing was that it was a lot of data, a lot of observations. There were also some observations that were kept uh, by the Maryland Ornithological Society um, from 1992 to 96. Uh, there were some other data that he used um, 
from the 1970s and 80s. And so what he found, uh, now, when you're reading a paper, uh, you know, you get to the results section, and the results were this. Uh, the barn swallow, he said, uh, noted that those tended to arrive earlier in spring than they had uh, arrived uh, in the 1880s. The uh, red-eyed vireo, the scarlet tanager, and the chimney swift seem to be arriving at about the same time over this 112-year interval, while the great crested flycatcher and the wood thrush tended to arrive later in spring. That's it. Also, he put together, um, uh, he, he could take these data and uh, parse them into uh, charts to, and, and then he used uh, some statistical methods to uh, give a most likely um, trend through those data. So he was able to show whether the arrivals were uh, coming sooner or later or staying about the same. However, these were, as you can see, there's a lot of scatter about the points. <laughs> so uh, you have to take that for what it's worth. Um, and th those are his results. The, and often the results in a scientific paper are, well, there you have it. So I would often remind my students that, uh, you know, there are the results and they can just kind of be take it or leave it. So it's what happens after that. It's what you get in the discussion section. And often it's what you get towards the end of the discussion section, which leads you to the real purpose. Why did this guy write this paper? And what, what did he have on his mind? And here it is, right in the, I think it's the last paragraph in the, in the paper, that there is an irony in the history of migration counts. Just when the possible importance of this, the oldest avian monitoring program in the continent is documented, it ceases to exist. So while collection of arrival dates has largely stopped, the interest has not. And so Sam, at this point, Sam and his um, co-workers, at this point are really saying, Let's get with it, people. Uh, we need these data, and we're going to have to pick it back up again. So the North American Bird Phenology Program was revived in uh, 2008 and started to, and it went live online in 2009 because they realized, well, we have a wealth of data here uh, from the late 1800s, uh, and we can compare that with uh, things more than a century later to determine how climate change may affect bird migration. Does it or doesn't it? So uh, this is managed by the USGS and nearly 1 million records have been hand transcribed by um, people as you noted in the article uh, by Zelt et al, including Sam Drogi. Uh, in the 2012 article in the International Journal of Zoology. Uh, and here they note that, uh, well, there are differences. Uh, according to region, this would be the hummingbirds. They also noted that there are differences in time of appearance in terms of purple martins. Uh, and you can see from the confidence uh, levels here, you can kind of do a at least, at least squares mean calibrated eyeball and see that, well, these would be, certainly this would be significantly different from that. Um, and so you can see that, well, the Purple Martins, for some reason, are arriving earlier. Uh, this axis is the Julian date, meaning that January 1 is Julian date 1. January 31st is Julian date 31, February 1st is Julian date 32, and so on and so forth. So you can see that these are arriving earlier. Well, once again, those are the results. Um, those are the answers. But what's important 
the real take home lesson is while answers are fine, questions are better. And because they lead us on into studying things. So as uh, they put it in this article, uh, does climate change slow or speed up migration in hummingbirds? Do the hummingbirds increase stopover periods in mountains, which are disproportionately affected by warming climates? So on and so forth with these other questions. So it's the questions that lead a study on. Science is a question addressing and question making uh, activity. And it needs programs such as this. Well, in order to do this, can you imagine the amount of money it would take if you had to pay people to do this? Even, even at uh, say $15 an hour or even half of that, it just wouldn't be possible. So this is why programs such as what we're doing, volunteer phenology projects are so important because they give us the data that we really need in order to address these questions. So if you wonder, wow, this is a lot of work, will anybody ever care? Yeah, the answer is yes. And so that's one of the main reasons we're doing this. I think it's one of the main uh, take home lessons from everything that we're doing here. So with that, I will stop sharing and give it back to uh, Denise. Great, thanks so much, Bob. Thanks for the overview and also for the, um, the thumbs up for all of the community sciences. You know, we don't always appreciate all the effort and the time and the hours that folks give. And I know that um, transcribing records is a really important um, element that a lot of museums depend on and other large uh, data studies. So something that we can do in winter when we're not uh, maybe out in the field um, so often. But um, yeah, thanks, Bob, for your overview. I appreciate you putting all the links together for that uh, phenology update. And we'll have another uh, history short Short next week from, from Dr. Bob. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn the, uh, the podium over to Andrew Hoffman, who's joining us to talk about amphibian phenology. Andrew is a graduate student in the School of Environment and Natural Resources down in Columbus. And um, I first heard about Andrew last year from his great infographic that talks about uh, frog calls. I shared all of that with you and um, and then um, got turned on to his YouTube channels where he gives some really nice short updates of things he's seeing out in nature and asked him to come um, this morning and give us an overview of uh, phenology as it relates to amphibians. So Andrew, thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. I was just looking at the number of people in here. That's a that's a big crowd. <laughs> I think I saw that you say 300 something for the group uh, during our email exchange, but I didn't realize so much of that would actually translate to being here in this talk. Um, yeah, so I will go ahead and share my screen here if I can. That's not what I want to share. There we go. <clears throat> so I am a, uh, well, for the next few weeks at least, I'm still a graduate student at OSU. I just recently defended my dissertation, and I my dissertation was mostly to do with rattlesnakes, timber rattlesnakes in Ohio, uh, and we did a lot of trying to understand the interaction between ongoing forest management and timber rattlesnake ecology, but one aspect of that actually did get into phenology a little bit. We were interested in understanding their patterns of emergence in the spring. Um, however, I, that maybe is for a different day. I am going to focus today on amphibians, which though it wasn't the focus of my most recent research, I did do my master's with amphibians and, and pool breeding, wetland breeding amphibians, and have worked quite a bit with them in the past. And uh, if, if phenology is relevant to any group of reptiles and amphibians, it's relevant to amphibians, especially um, pond breeding amphibians, because so much of understanding their ecology is tied to the seasons and the seasonality of their breeding events. <clears throat> Just a quick background on amphibians here, and some of this may look somewhat familiar if you if you did see if you were at the uh, Ohio Volunteer Master Naturalist courses that I use some parts of these slides for. But Ohio actually has a pretty good diversity of amphibians for a, for a U.S. state, and part of that is because we are actually really close to the global biodiversity hotspot for salamanders. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? What part of the of what part of the world has more salamander species than any other place? I'm curious, I'm kind of watching chat. See if anybody pops up with the answer here. 
I'm sure I can see chat when I'm in share mode here. There we go. Does anybody know where the global biodiversity hotspot for salamanders is? There you go. Yeah, Smoky Mountains. So the Southern Appalachians. Um, and Ohio is obviously very close, globally speaking, to the Southern Appalachians. So some, a lot of that 41 species count comes from salamanders because we happen to be so close. Now, frogs are much more diverse in the tropics than anywhere else on the planet. But for salamanders, we get a lot of diversity. And of course, amphibians, if I can get it, are well known for having the smooth, permeable skin wet skin, some people might say slimy, although really there's only certain species that produce a mucousy kind of slime, uh, at least enough to talk about. And, uh, and you know, a consequence of this permeable skin is on the, on the flip side or on the plus side for amphibians, they can actually breathe through their skin. Many of them breathe directly through their skin, but on the downside, they of course take in anything that might be toxic. Uh, they're very sensitive to environmental change, often touted as the canary in the coal mine. But something that maybe is not talked about so much is that amphibians are obligate predators, uh, at least as adults. Frogs and salamanders, to my knowledge, across the board are all carnivores. And when I say carnivores, I mean they, they're eating very small things, they're eating insects and the like, but still they're animals that have to eat other animals to survive. And something you might not think about is they all have little teeth. And though most amphibians are very small, when you get to the very, the very few very big amphibians on the planet, they actually have very sharp teeth and can give you an extremely painful bite. Um, so these are little nightmares for insects. They're very, very effective little predators. And of course, probably more relevant to what we're going to talk about today, the, the name amphibia comes from, I believe, translated loosely, both lives or two lives. So they have a biphasic life cycle, which is something that's uh, not uncommon among invertebrates and even fish, but it's, of course, very uncommon among other vertebrates, other terrestrial vertebrates don't have this same kind of biphasic life cycle where you have the larva that transforms into an adult that looks very different, but amphibians do. <clears throat> Now there are, this biphasic life cycle is kind of thought of as, as the, the basic, the, the standard amphibian model, but there are a lot of variations to this. And in Ohio even, we see much of the variation that you see globally with amphibians. We have fully aquatic amphibians like the hellbender and the mud puppy that live their entire lives in streams or lakes. Uh, we have fully terrestrial amphibians like redback salamanders and green salamanders and slimy salamanders which they do have, they do technically have a larval developmental stage, but it's abbreviated and it's contained entirely within the egg. So they're able to lay their eggs underground and then they just hatch out as a little miniature version of the adults. Now newts have an aquatic larval stage and it does look fairly different from their adult stage, but they have a weird kind of triphasic and fluctuating life cycle. They have a little tiny aquatic larva and then they go to a terrestrial eft or terrestrial juvenile stage, which is pretty familiar to a lot of people. And that this is actually sometimes thought of as a dispersal stage to get from pond to pond, but some studies have shown that this actually may be a, a way to avoid high competition within the ponds that these newts live because the adult newts are aquatic and live at very high densities in ponds and wetlands. So these are, uh, just to say there's a lot of variation on this standard amphibian biphasic life cycle. And we're not gonna talk as much today about these other critters because either they're very rare and not encountered very often in the state or actually witnessing the different cycles of their life is very rare as it is with uh, redback salamanders, which are common, but you're very unlikely to see a nest of redbacks or really notice that much when they're going through their, their different breeding cycles. However, when we uh, are talking about things that have aquatic larvae like the, uh, the mole salamanders, spotted salamanders, tiger salamanders, and all of the frogs, we are getting into this realm of wetland and pool breeding animals that have very noticeable cycles that are tied very noticeably to seasons and that we can key into. And once we do, that will allow us not only to better understand what they're doing, but also just to know when to look for them, where to look for them, and understand what they're doing when we find them. And I just sort of threw up a whole mess of these wetland breeding, these still water breeding amphibians up here from Ohio, uh, because I want to point out that despite the fact that there's so much variation in the timing of the breeding and where they breed and all the other things about their life history, there is one sort of unifying thing that shapes the natural history of all of these still water breeding animals. And for the most part, amphibians in general that, that breed in the water have to adapt to one predator, fish. 
fish are such an incredibly effective predator on amphibian larvae and eggs that they've shaped the evolution of amphibians uh, in a huge way. And so to some extent, you can actually sort of sort out amphibians, uh, especially here in Ohio, by how they try to um, not be eaten by fish, how they deal with fish as a potential predatory pressure. And you can kind of think of this in, in a two category way, although it's really more of a gradient, in that some just try to avoid fish. They, they don't lay their eggs or have larvae, uh, undergo their larval stage in wetlands or ponds or habitats with fish. And others are unpalatable or even toxic to fish. Now, the thing you'll probably immediately notice is that the vast majority of the, the pictures that I threw up here, which are fairly representative of amphibians in Ohio, wetland breeding amphibians broadly, fall out on the avoidance side of the spectrum. And there is a reason for that. It's not coincidence. Um, but you'll notice there's a few pictures that are kind of to the right here. Newts, you know, they didn't really fit on the left as well. They're a funny one. The adults are highly toxic. The, the Fs are highly toxic in general to terrestrial predators, to vertebrates. But the, uh, the larva, at least to my knowledge, and sort of doing a cursory review of some of the literature on palatability in amphibian larva, the larva don't appear to be particularly toxic to fish. So um, they, they are very small. They don't have a very long larval period. So the adults don't have much of a problem living alongside fish and their larvae are so small and the larval period so short that they, they can deal with fish better than some others, but they're not quite like a bullfrog, which is truly resistant to fish. They're, they're tadpoles, big bullfrog tadpoles. You see them in big ponds and, and lakes and rivers. And that's because and they're just sitting out right in the middle where they could be picked off by any fish they want, but they're unpalatable to fish. So that's why they can do that. So we really end up with just three species that you could classify as having unpalatable larva, uh, maybe four. <clears throat> but the American bullfrog and green frog are the two main ones. Toads uh, have a degree of unpalatability to, to fish, but they, they often will breed in shallows of streams and wetlands without fish so that they kind of breed all over the place and they don't, they're not really adapted specifically just to breed alongside fish like uh, green frogs and bullfrogs are. But bullfrogs are by and large the most unpalatable of all these amphibians. And just a reminder, when I, when I mean unpalatability, I mean the, the larva, uh, the tadpoles are unpalatable. <clears throat> now, only three out of the 22 still water or wetland breeding amphibians in the state are unpalatable to fish, which you look around here and you think of where you see ponds and where you see fish and you think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because you know, nearly every pond I encounter has fish. So why wouldn't more of these species be adapted to breed in these abundant wetlands? Well, there's a problem here. Uh, the Ohio that once was, the Ohio of hundreds of years ago, did not look obviously uh, like it did does today. So this is an aerial image of a, a winter image of um, Blackwick Woods Metro Park just east of town. And I think minus the trails, it's a pretty good approximation of, of what the Ohio of the distant past might have looked like. It was forested almost entirely, and there were a lot of wetlands everywhere, a lot of wet woods, a lot of depressional seasonal ponds and pools. <clears throat> now, if you were to just pick any kind of any kind of woods in on the landscape you might not look too different from this. You might have lots of wetlands. And so as a result, the most abundant breeding sites for amphibians were seasonal fishless wetlands. These wetlands that didn't hold water year round. Many years they would dry up. Most years maybe they would dry up. So you have these amphibians that are mostly adapted for a landscape where the most abundant water resource is, uh, is seasonal and fishless. And that's why you get things like spotted salamanders and wood frogs and spring peepers, which don't do well alongside fish, but they have larvae that can transform quick enough to take advantage of these seasonal pools. However, this is what most of all right now, neighborhoods and farm fields and only tiny patches of woods where most of these seasonal wetlands have been drained because humans don't find much of a purpose for seasonal wetlands. Uh, they, they get in the way of our farming efforts. They, uh, they, we think of them as mosquito breeding grounds. So I think many people see these little swamps or pools or puddles as useless and they drain them. <clears throat> and what they see as useful are larger ponds that they can swim in, that they can fish on, uh, and they introduce predatory fish to these ponds. So instead of the landscape just completely dotted by small temporary pools, we have a landscape with sporadic, very big, very deep ponds that in a far distant past were probably much rarer and more, more located along riverways and riparian corridors and, and maybe in areas where there's a lot of glacial activity that carved out deeper ponds. So we've, 
essentially changed the landscape from one that was very suitable to this broad slew of amphibians that were adapted to breed in seasonal fishless ponds to one that caters very much to this one or two species that do really well in these big, deep, permanent ponds full of fish. Um, we've, we've tilted the scale in the favor of, of lower biodiversity, as we have with many other groups of animals. So now let's get into the, the, the meat of this, the, the phenology of amphibians, the seasonality of their breeding. And the first thing I want to talk about, because there's a few layers to this, is the actual habitats that they breed in and how these are tied to season and seasonality and the, the adaptations that each group and each species has. So this is, that picture is just sort of a, a background picture to show you what a, a typical forest vernal seasonal pool might look like, or a series of small vernal pools. And on the, on the lower end of, of the hydro period spectrum here, and by hydro period, I just mean how long a pool holds water in a given year, we have things like old tire ruts, uh, pools, puddles. And another statement I want to make is that just like with forests, where you're hard pressed to find any forests in Ohio or very many forests in Ohio that have not been completely timbered and, and cut down to where they're gone and then regrown, you're very unlikely to find wetlands that have been in their current state since, you know, two or three hundred years ago. Uh, they exist, but they're, they're very few and far between. Most of the wetlands are the result of human activity, either directly created to be a pond or a wetland, or in the case of ruts, maybe a forest that you see now uh, 50 to 100 years ago was a farm field, a pasture that people drove heavy machinery through and created these divots that now look like very nice natural ruts and sometimes very productive little ruts. But these short hydro period pools may only last two or three months at, at most, maybe just a few weeks, but they have very few predators because there's only a small subset of animals that are adapted to be able to live or breed in such a, a temporary water resource. And uh, these are some of the, the faces you're likely to see around these really short hydro period pools. You've got spring peepers and chorus frogs and mountain chorus frogs that will utilize pretty much all of the little temporary pools that you can find out there. And it's not so much that they're able to reliably always get out of those pools, their larvae aren't always able to get out of those pools before they dry up. But these, these animals kind of almost take an insect-like strategy to their breeding, where there's just hundreds, thousands of them, they breed everywhere, and many of them in many places will die out in some years, but some years they'll make it. And um, it's, uh, it's just a strategy whereby they're, they're outputting a lot of offspring everywhere, and they're, they don't have real high survivorship. But they have a, a short enough period, and when I say the, the numbers up there are the amount of time it takes them to go from egg to frog that can get out of the water. So about three months for spring peepers and, and chorus frogs. And that's a short enough time to make it through in a lot of years for these very short hydro period pools and ruts if they breed early enough, which we'll get to on the next slide. Now toads have an even shorter uh, sort of period to go from egg to toadlet. And that's good because they breed later than spring peepers. So they have to be able to get out of these same environments much quicker. And throughout most of Ohio, American toads and, and to some extent Fowler's toads have the quickest turnaround of any amphibians getting their, uh, their larva out of these wetlands. However, the, the reigning champion of quick metamorphosis is the spadefoot, which you can see has often metamorphosis in under a month. And spadefoots are very rare in Ohio. They're only found in the southeastern corner of the state. Um, but they're a unique little critter, and I don't get into them too much on the next slide where I actually break down the month-to-month -month phenology of these animals. But they, they essentially are adapted to breed after extremely heavy torrential rain. They're sort of a, a desert species. Most of the species live in the southwest of Spadefoots in North America. They, they like dry, arid conditions. But in Ohio, they're in the southeast part of the state in kind of floodplain habitats. And after really torrential rains, they, they all emerge by the thousands and they go to these super temporary pools and floodwater areas, lay their eggs, and within two to four weeks often, they go from egg to larva to little toadlet, and then they come out and dig underground again. And they'll breed any time you get a torrential rain because their, their period that it takes them to get out of the water is so quick that they can start breeding in March or they can start breeding in July. It doesn't matter that much. They, they're out within a month. And the pools dry up you know, very quickly regardless of, of when they fill. So this is a species that's a little bit less seasonal in that way and more tied to just heavy rain events. Now on the, the next step up, we have kind of the, the moderate end of things. And this is where probably most of your vernal pools and, and high quality fishless wetlands fall out. These are 
ponds or wetlands that dry up most years, maybe a lot of years, but they may hold water almost till the end of the year for most years. And they, they have more predators as a result. They have a lot of dragonfly naiads and, and insect larvae that are pretty efficient predators on amphibian larvae, but importantly, they do not have fish. That's a big one. And that's what allows species like wood frogs and spotted salamanders and leopard frogs, and really the vast majority of amphibians, uh, pool breeding amphibians in the state to use these kind of wetlands, these fishless, moderate hydro period kind of, uh, of wetlands. And you can see the numbers get a little bit more variable here for metamorphosis for these animals. Uh, and part of that, and actually for spotted salamanders, I could have extended one end of that all the way out to 12 months, but that's a little misleading because that's sort of a, a rare occasion when they find a fishless spring fed pond that they can stay in year round. Um, but most of these animals breed in the very early spring. Actually, most of them breed in March, as we'll see here in the next slide, and they metamorphose by July, usually, or, or in July, maybe. So that's, that's the typical period, uh, and you have lots of variation. A, a fishless wetland hold water longer and is a little cooler. They, it may take them longer to get out, maybe a little more shaded. Their, uh, their metamorphosis is, is pretty dependent on temperature, the growth and metamorphosis, and of course, prey. And of course, on the other end, we have the largest permanent ponds, and these nearly always have fish. They don't always have fish. There are permanent ponds that are fishless that are great breeding sites. But generally, these big permanent ponds have fish. They also have some pretty large and, and pretty intimidating in, invertebrate and insect predators as well. So you've got the, the luxury of a long hydro period. You don't have the the adaptive pressure to have quick metamorphosis, but you do have quite a bit of adaptive pressure to combat those fish predators to resist them. And not surprisingly, you see the longest metamorphosis times here. In fact, bullfrogs can take two or three years to metamorphose and green frogs often overwinter as well. And that's because they can, they don't have to, to rush to get out of these wetlands so they can overwinter and they, they often do. The further south you go uh, in, the, in the country, the less, the less you see this overwintering behavior but they're very well adapted to deal with the, the problems of breeding in a permanent pond. So let's break down the actual seasonal changes that, that happen here. And I wanna kind of give you a calendar for amphibian breeding. I know I, I gave out that um, infographic last year for, the, for frogs, I think primarily. So this is uh, maybe not quite as visually appealing, but it, it gives you an idea for month by month who's breeding. And we start out in the winter. And I think it surprises a lot of people know that amphibians are breeding when almost nothing else is visually happening out there in the woods when there's snow, when there's ice. But our first amphibian breeder is the Jefferson salamander. And Jefferson salamanders, their peak breeding is usually kind of early February. It depends on the part of the state, but in Southern Ohio, they'll be breeding in January. It's very weather dependent. So it's, it's basically the, the first small stretch you get where the weather's not freezing and that the ice starts to melt a little bit and there's maybe not any snow out. Maybe there is snow, maybe there's not, but the, it gets a little bit more moderate or mild. These salamanders move and, and move into ponds, often partially frozen ponds, and then they lay their eggs sometimes under ice and then they, they get out. And the Jefferson salamanders actually leave just as everything else is kind of getting going um, in March. And the other thing is, I think a lot of people, maybe not everybody here, but a lot of people I talk to associate frogs and frog calls as a sound of summer. And as I'll show here in a minute, summer is the most, one of the most depopper times for frog, uh, frog and amphibian diversity and breeding activity. And where it's really at is this early spring, March and April period of time, which is why I've uh, made this bold here. But it's March when pretty much everything in the genus Ambystema comes out to breed. And Ambystema includes the spotted salamander, Ambystema maculatum, the tiger salamander, Ambystema tigrinum. It includes smallmouth salamanders and, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. who else am I forgetting that's in Ohio? Blue spotted salamanders, Jefferson sal well, Jefferson salamanders are obviously finishing up usually in March, though you can still see them in the ponds. And it includes one kind of strange salamander that we'll talk about here at the very end that doesn't fit into any of these early spring categories. So all of these salamanders, these big colorful mole salamanders that mostly live underground, move to these ponds and lay these big uh, gelatinous eggs in the ponds during this time. And all of the little uh, pseudacris, like your spring peepers, your chorus frogs, your mountain chorus frogs, they all breed. Their peak breeding is usually during March in Ohio, into April a little bit. Wood frogs, the, the quintessential vernal pool breeding frog, they have that little brown mask by their eye and they kind of have a clucking duck-like call they have a very short breeding period during March, usually just a week or two that you can hear them out calling. And this is also when leopard frogs mostly breed is in, is in March. So this is a very, very busy time. This is when these temporary vernal pools are very loud. 
Oftentimes it's when the deep permanent fish ponds are the quietest. There's nothing going on there because nothing that breeds during this time of year breeds in those kind of environments. But then as you transition into April and sometimes even late March in Southern Ohio, you get kind of a, a shifting of the guards to the, the late spring breeders. And this is mostly gonna be a backdrop of calling tree frogs and calling toads. So a lot of trills and bird-like songs take over for the peeping and the clucking and the, the other sounds of the early spring frogs. And I don't have any sounds to play you today. I've, I've tried to do sounds and video on, on PowerPoint through Zoom before and it's not worked out. But there, I, I do have some videos showcasing some of these calls on the, um, on the YouTube channel that uh, Denise mentioned earlier. So you're welcome to check those out, but there's lots of great resources online for frog calls. Um, April's an interesting month. It, the salamanders mostly are gone by the time you get into, especially mid and late April. They're kind of done with their breeding season in these wetlands and their eggs have been deposited, but you do get uh, most of, like I said, the tree frogs and the toads. And you get a couple really interesting critters like the pickerel frog. So uh, pickerel frogs, though we often associate them with caves and streams and kind of shady environments like that, they, they breed in wetlands. They usually, they usually breed in wetlands just like leopard frogs do. And they're a strange critter because they actually have a snoring call. So both leopard frogs and pickerel frogs have kind of a drawn out snore in part of their call. But the pickerel frogs is a very drawn out so just a very drawn out snore and they call underwater. So it, it gets this weird muffly low, uh, low frequency kind of sound to it. But they tend to breed in April. You don't hear big resonating courses of them, but if you find a pond and go out to it, it's a very surreal experience to, not, to know none of these frogs are on the surface and just hear this rumbling snore coming from underwater somewhere around you. And then the very unique little four-toed salamander. They, they're very different than everything else. Um, unlike most of these frogs and, and the salamanders we've talked about, they're not making a, a migration to a pool, laying eggs in the pond and leaving. The female four-toed salamanders, as adults, they're, they're about four inches at most. They're the smallest salamander in the state. They move to very small ruts and pools and springs and areas like that. And they get up under mosses and sedges that overhang the water. They lay their eggs, as you can see there, in the, the tendrils of the moss and in the tendrils of the sedge, and they guard them for a month or so. And then when the eggs hatch, the larva just sort of drip down through the moist moss into the water below and develop very, very quickly. So they're a unique little critter. They're the only plethodontid or lungless salamander we're talking about in these pool areas. Once we get into May, you start to kind of lose diversity and really you're down to just the, the remnant calling uh, toads and tree frogs. You get the, the, the Cricket frogs tend to start coming in and calling in late April and May, and they, they peak sometime in May. So cricket frogs have a very distinctive, sounds like you're clacking marbles together, kind of. And this is another kind of sound of summer because this is one of the later calling species. So people sometimes associate that marble clicking as a sound of summer, but they breed in, in mostly fishless wetlands. They don't do as well with fish as most of these do. And as we transition into summer, we're also switching the kind of wetland we're at because by June or certainly by late July, a lot of the wetlands that the, we've been sort of watching things develop in earlier ha, are drying or have dried up. So now we're talking about these permanent ponds, usually with fish in them. And this is the season of the green frog and the bullfrog. And unlike everything else, these, these two frogs are very, very different in a lot of ways. Not only are they unpalatable to fish so they can breed in fish ponds, but they, because they're breeding in the summer and their larvae can overwinter, they have a very drawn out breeding season. And instead of this distinct migration to breeding site, migration away from breeding site that most Ohio amphibians undergo, bullfrogs and green frogs set up shop. The, the male bullfrogs actually defend territories throughout much of the summer and they call throughout the day and the night and they, they actively vie for, for territories and then sort of uh, breed with females as they come in. And so that's a very different strategy from most frogs which just all move to the ponds at once. It's a huge breeding frenzy and they, they all leave. But these frogs not only breed in different environments, they, they do everything in a very different way. But as you get into June and July, not much else is calling. As I mentioned in the last slide, you may get a torrential flood if you live in Southeast Ohio in the very small areas that have spadefoots and you might get spadefoots coming back out. Often during these same big rain events in the early summer, especially, you'll have another, another surge of fowler's toads and gray tree frogs that will come out and call. But, and cricket frogs may continue into June, but there's not much else calling throughout the summer. And usually by the time you're getting into August and September, even the bullfrogs and green frogs are, are getting quiet. 
And you'd think this was the end of the season, but the, the salamander I mentioned earlier, it's a very different critter. It's one of these mole salamanders, like, like the spotted, like the tiger, is coming to breed in dry pools, in the dry remnants or the drying remnants of the wetlands we talked about earlier, these fishless wetlands. And this is the marbled salamander. These are actually the smallest of the mole salamanders. They're, you know, mole salamanders can get seven, eight inches long. Tiger salamanders can get really big. But this is relatively small for a mole salamander, salamander maybe just five inches, something like that. And these little critters, though they're small as adults, actually become the predators on all of the other mole salamanders that share these wetlands. Uh, because they, they lay their eggs in the drying ponds on land, those are actually, those little balls are actually sort of eggs that haven't yet hydrated, and the females guard them, just like the four toad. Guarding eggs is actually very widespread in salamanders. If they're not dropping them in the water, they're usually guarding them. Uh, redback salamanders guard their eggs, for instance. Dusky salamanders guard their eggs. But the, the marbled salamanders guard their eggs until these ponds fill in the late fall and early winter, and then the, the females leave the pond basin and the eggs hatch. And as the larva develop throughout the winter, by the time the Jefferson salamander comes to lay its eggs in the early winter, maybe late winter, the larva of the marbled salamander are, are pretty large. And certainly by the time you get wood frogs and spotted salamanders moving in, these are large enough to be predators on all of the other amphibians that then move into the pond. So that's sort of the cycle of things. And that's how this smaller species has adapted to deal with competition from other species, because though fish shape much of what we're talking about, the seasonality of their breeding, there, there's competition from other amphibians and, and predation from invertebrates as well and other amphibians. So that's kind of the, the season of things in these wetlands and, and how things play out. But there's interesting other aspects of their biology that are tied to the timing of their breeding. For instance, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders have big gelatinous egg masses. They have this really thick coat. If you pick them up, it feels like you're holding onto jelly. And it's not a coincidence that a lot of the salamanders that breed during this time period and, and frogs have these very jelly coated eggs, leopard frogs, pickerel frogs. I didn't, don't have pickerel frogs circled there, but they do as well. And that a lot of the frogs that breed during this time have just a thin layer of eggs that sort of spread out. There's no jelly, there's no substantial jelly coating around it. So some of this is thermal buffering. The wood frogs all lay their eggs in huge clustered clumps together with big amounts of jelly around them as sort of freeze protection. Uh, oftentimes after they deposit their eggs, spotted salamanders too, there's going to at least be a thin freeze over the pond. Now that jelly coating doesn't protect them from a hard freeze. It's just a slight buffering. So they, they do have die-offs of eggs sometimes, but investing a little bit more in buffering their eggs does give them some protection against cold weather. Whereas even though bullfrogs as adults grow to this huge size, they, their eggs are very kind of thin and, and dinky and, and don't look like much. And wood frog eggs, which the adults are pretty small, the egg masses are very big, very big and very jelly-like. So this is just one difference you see. Of course, the, the larval development is, is very different. Bullfrogs, though they start out small, they end up with very large larvae over a year or so because they have that time to grow. Whereas wood frogs and leopard frogs, they may, they may metamorphose with larvae that are not much bigger than that. They don't, they don't grow to real big sizes before they metamorphose. So how does this translate into us wanting to go out and see these animals and, and survey for them and understand what is where? Uh, in the early spring during this time period is a really effective time to use minnow traps like this one here and actually putting glow sticks for whatever reason seems to draw salamanders especially into the traps but if you want to sample for things like jefferson salamanders and spotted salamanders you can go out and look for them at night with a headlamp that can be a very effective way to see them during this season but putting traps out is super effective sometimes you'll pull a trap up that has 30 salamanders in it uh, they, they really come out in huge numbers all at once and if you're driving around, you make sure to watch the road because they, they often have to cross roads to get from their terrestrial habitat to the wetland during this time on rainy nights. But this is, you know, we talk about how do you go find cryptic animals. And with reptiles, I've been tracking rattlesnakes. It's hard. You can know everything about rattlesnakes and still go out and search for hours and hours for days and days and never see one. But for these amphibians, the, the seasonality, the phenology of their activity is so predictable that if you know roughly the kind of weather that triggers their movements, it's usually related to rain and temperature, and you know the timing of those movements, what, what month, what few weeks does it usually fall within, you go out on the right night, you see the animals. 
and it's, it's very, very predictable. And often you see hundreds of animals. So that makes them actually a really reliable type of critter to survey for if you bound your survey techniques correctly. And uh, the salamanders, if you want to see the adults, this is the time to do it. Obviously frogs, we have a whole frog call survey set up, a, a national sort of survey protocol you can follow. But the fact that they call makes it very easy. But if you want to be extra certain, or you can't start sampling until later in the year, you can do some dip, dip net sampling during this time, especially May and June, when you can expect nearly all the larva of anything that's bred in that wetland to be developing in that, in that wetland, in that pond in some stage. But these are, these are ways to assess what's living in a given wetland. And it's not only a good way to sample a wetland if you just wanna know for yourself or if you're doing some research, but it's also a great way to involve students, to involve groups to, to sort of get up public interest because amphibians are one of these groups that you can target fairly reliably big impressive natural events and show a whole bunch of people something amazing. And these are the, these are the ways to do it by understanding the seasonality of it, understanding the triggers to movement and, and knowing what techniques to use and when to use them. So hopefully that's given you somewhat of an, an idea of the seasonality of, the, of amphibians here in Ohio of what you can see and when you can see it and what kind of activities you might wanna schedule around them. So hopefully I have time to take questions if anybody has any. Great, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, there was a question mm -hmm. about what the triggers are for these, um, this different sequence. Is it temperature, uh, air or water temperature, photo period? Yeah, so I, I didn't, I sort of purposely didn't get that into that too deep because my knowledge of that is not too deep, but I know it is, some of, you know, I don't know, what I don't know is I don't know how much is related to day length. Uh, I don't know how much they are bound by just, they only come out during the season, but certainly temperature and rain have a big impact. And for some species like spadefoots, it's pretty clear that rain uh, more than anything else is the trigger. So for instance, you know, any time from, from March to, like I said, July, as long as it's not freezing, as long as the temperature is somewhat reasonable, if you get a torrential enough rain, it brings the spadefoots out and not much else matters. Um, for something like a Jefferson salamander, it, it seems to, it's probably largely related to temperature. They can actually do a lot of their moving earlier than when they're breeding. So I've seen big movements of Jefferson salamanders in the fall, which I presume, and I've heard other people speculate this as well, that they are moving to the the area around the wetlands in preparation for as soon as they get a warm spell to just come up and breed in the wetlands. Um, so I, I'd say for most of these early spring breeders, probably temperature trumps rain. Rain uh, certainly will dictate how big of how big and synchronous the movements are, but temperature will just dictate when they start trying to breed. Uh, and they'll, they'll move regardless of how much rain they get. But if they don't get much rain, the worst condition, the, the thing I hate when it's, you have an early spring where you get good warmth, but no rain, because then you just get very slow trickle movements of amphibians to these wetlands as the weather hits, as the temperatures hit their sort of preferred temperature. And it's usually small densities and, and the whole year may not see the big mass gatherings that, that you like to see with the amphibians. But um, good temperature plus rain during the window that they typically breed in is, is what triggers most of these species. Great. Thank you in the chat here. so much, Andrew. I know uh, folks, Andrew would love a, a thank you in the chat box. We really appreciate your time. So gracious of you to program together for us. And I didn't realize, Andrew, that this you were defending your dissertation this month. So an especially busy uh, time for you. So really appreciate your willingness to share your time and expertise with us um, this morning. And um, uh, best of luck to you. Are you leaving the state or do you know yet what your next steps are? So I, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. So I, uh, yeah, and, and I, so I'm past my dissertation defense now, and I just submitted my final draft of my dissertation yesterday, the day before. So I'm actually pretty calm right now, but it was in leading up to this presentation, it wasn't so bad. Um, I am staying in Ohio. So I, I will be staying in Ohio, staying in Ohio State, staying in the lab, uh, doing a postdoc. So I'm going to be working with Massasaugus, the other Ohio rattlesnake for the next couple of years. Okay. Great, thanks again, really appreciate your time. Yeah, and sure. uh, now let's see, Joe, I bet you need uh, me to make you a co-host. Are you already a co-host? Mm. Share screens. Uh, we have the there share we screen button available, okay. yes. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so now we're up to uh, some phonology and practice. So I was at a uh, on a Zoom with Petra and Joe, Petra Schrombrock and uh, Joe Carter a couple months ago. And um, 
Petra was talking about how much she liked the book, the um, Naturalist Notebook, and so I invited her to come and uh, talk a little bit about it and get other folks interested and excited about it. So thanks, you guys. Okay. Yeah, it was actually Joe who is more interested. So Joe uh, puts, this, puts this together, and I was just the assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I guess the first question um, that I have is why journal, why use the naturalist notebook, and how does phonology fit into that? Um, I was just introduced to phonology uh, last January and started using the naturalist notebook. Um, and so this is the world according to me. Um, so um, my experience with nature has been longstanding. I was a Boy Scout um, back in the summer of many moons ago in 1972. I worked on a YCC crew for the summer. Um, so I've always been interested in nature. So this the addition of phonology and the naturalist notebook um, has been pretty exciting for me. Um, so my interest, and everybody's going to be different, um, is just going out in nature and observing, uh, protecting ecosystems, and um, learning how to restore ecosystems. Um, I also like to grow native plants and trees. Um, I like taking photos. Uh, I'm not a photographer, but I like taking photos. Um, reading, uh, and um, also I do trail maintenance for the Buckeye Trail Association, and I call that my my door to wonder. Um, I'm not a big backpacker or anything, but it gives me a an entry into the woods, and I kind of go go by Ed Abbey. I paraphrased him, um, save time for the enjoyment of nature. So that's kind of a little bit of uh, my background, and. Um, everybody's um, background is different, so your approach is going to be different. Um, some of the tools I use, and I, I like to use, um, um, the Naturalist Notebook. Um, I, I always have a camera or the iPhone with me because I, I'm not really a drawler, um, but I do keep a, a, a journal. And, the, and recently I started keeping a, a, a binder um, with more current projects. That's a diagram of uh, um, a garden and planting, a, a pollinator garden for one of my projects. Um, so that's kind of the tools I use. And, um, and then some examples on how we've used, I've used the um, phonology and um, the notebook this spring. Um, here's an example from Logan, Ohio, near Logan. Um, uh, degree day is 13, but the sap was running on the maple trees on one of my friend's um, uh, properties. So um, that was kind of fun. And then um, a spring camping trip to Pike State Forest in March. Um, Here's an example of the degree day was 134. And we were really excited to find this snow trillium uh, blooming in this kind of deep ravine in Pike State Forest. And I've never ever seen a snow trillium before. This was the first one. Um, but this was in a, um, a, like you say, a steep ravine. So it was a little later probably um, than other areas where snow trilliums were blooming. Uh, and an, another indication um, for the trillium to be here, there's probably some limestone or dolomite in the, in the um, area. It was mostly um, sand, sandstone and shale, but we found this trillium and so that would give us an indication of, um, of that. Um, also, when you're hiking uh, in state forests, you get you can get some different views. Um, you can get very beautiful forest, or you can come across clear cuts. Um, again, we we really like hiking in the state forest because 
Um, it gets you away from crowds and state parks. Um, and so, but the downside is you can be strolling along looking at wildflowers and big trees and then you stumble across what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, uh, and that could be a whole nother discussion, I think. Um, but then on the, on the good side, um, what I call, we came across what I call the uh, Grand Canyon of Pike State Forest. And it had some really interesting geology. I don't know if you want to chime in here, Petra, okay, on the geology yeah. here. So there's an overhang of sandstone, which is Mississippian. Um, and here, it's not quite totally clear in the photo, is the limestone. But because this is the area where we found the trillium, we know that there must be uh, limestone, the Max, uh, Maxwell limestone. And uh, another area has these river uh, rocks, which tend to be Berea sandstone. So this entire area, this cliff here from the top all the way down to the creek, uh, is covering probably 45 million years. That's why Joe called it the Grand Canyon of uh, Pike County <laughs> State Forest. Uh, and another trip we did then during the spring vacation was to one of the Arc of Appalachia's uh, Chalet de Val Preserve that is a little further south. And uh, we go dive even deeper into the geology. So just driving from our campground to uh, the preserve, we went back another 100 million years into the Peebles Dolomite area. Um, one other thing that when we're in the woods, um, I like to do is I like to look at the landscape and, and try to figure some of the cultural things that uh, goes on on the landscape. That's the, um, and in the one picture, we find a fence going through this tree. And again, it, it creates wonder in your mind on what was the land used for. We don't know, but um, and then in the creek bed, um, we found a few bricks down in this creek bed, which indicates some other usage, but we don't know what it was. Um, but that's part of what um, I like to do is not only read the natural landscape, but also the cultural part of the landscape. Another interesting thing when we were here, because this is people's dolomite, we assumed that there would be um, wild columbine there. We found the wild columbine, but uh, it wasn't blooming yet because we were only at 138 degree days. And um, I think Kelly had uh, showed some uh, wild columbine in her pictures. And I, I don't remember the degree days, but it was probably pretty, pretty well advanced from um, 138 when we were down there. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing when we were at this preserve is we came across a, um, a, a a shrub that we didn't, we weren't able to ID. So we took some pictures and we shared it with some people. Um, and we found out the first guests were, were that it was um, spice bush, but that wasn't correct. It was um, leatherwood. So you know, again, whenever we're in the woods, I like to take pictures and um, try to figure out what, what we're seeing and when. And let's see here. Again, another thing that we are interested in is restoration. And this was a walk we took along the Ole Ontangy bike path, um, 214 degree days. And it was an area that we knew was cleared with honeysuckle um, last fall. So we wanted to go back and see what was going on there. Um, and we were really excited about what we found. Um, is in the picture, I think you can see some of the big stumps of honeysuckle. It was a total um, thicket of honeysuckle. But with, when the honeysuckle was cleared this spring, um, came across trilliums, Virginia bluebells, Dutchman breeches, toothworts. Um, it, there's a huge thicket of pawpaws, trout lilies, spring beauties, wild ginger, um, and ramps. So uh, that was really exciting to see what happens when um, you help nature out a little bit. Okay, 
Um, and then the next example we have is along the Adena uh, bike path near Athens um, at uh, 255 degree days. And we found spectacular um, shows of um, large trilliums and um, large bellworts. Um, that day we also were helping uh, um, some um, AmeriCorps um, uh, people build trail in one of the Athens Conservancy's um, properties and we found um, pawpaws blooming. Um, and Petra rescued some flowers from the trail. We, we build trail and sometimes we have to, we have to um, go through some um, wildflowers, but uh, ephemerals, but Petra rescued some May apples and some pussy toes from the trail. So, and there you go, Petra. Yeah, and then comes uh, April 21st, and this is what the dogwood uh, in our garden looked like actually quite pretty and it's alive. Um, one thing that I see from that is that uh, this kind of erratic weather is demonstrating uh, climate model predictions that predict more erratic weather. And what I did here is I uh, made a plot of the daily increase of the going degree days in Dublin near where we live in Dublin, Ohio. And here is it's down to zero, so everything starts growing like crazy, and then boof, it shuts off again. <clears throat> um, this year, things survived, but of course, that could be detrimental, and this type of thing is uh, expected from climate change. And uh, one suggestion there is there is a, a climate change tree atlas. There's a website where you can look which tree species are more likely to survive these types of things. Um, and I guess lastly is since we're all on this journey of um, learning that uh, as part of it you share uh, with others um, what you what you've learned and we all have a um, unique set of knowledge and um, again we were this is um, we were working with another AmeriCorps um, group on uh, a project we we're working on at Sawmill Wetlands and what struck me is how young these, um, I call them kids, they were young adults, um, but they don't have near the experiences and, and knowledge that we have. So it's good for you to work with them and share uh, what your experiences have been and also to collaborate with other partners. Um, just on this one project, some of the partners we're collaborating with were the um, Flow, the Friends of Low Intelligence, you, oh, Watershed, ODNR, um, the AmeriCorps, and um, plants are being provided by Great, plant, great Plants, Great Networks. Um, so it's important that um, you learn and share your experiences. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh Joe and Petra, I really appreciate your um, sharing what you've seen and your degree day uh, calculations on those. And uh, Petra, especially the graph of the increase in, in growing degree days, I think that's really interesting.